Hi, Russell, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, hi. Um, I, I see you don't have the camera on yet. We're, we're live, uh, by the way. Yeah. No, I know we're live. I, I figured I would turn everything on when it was time. Okay, so you can turn on now and, and I'll meet you. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, fantastic. Okay, so we're not a fit, we're, we're, although we're live and people are kind of coming in, there's a bit of a delay. So in this couple of minutes, we'll, you know, even though everyone can hear us, we'll just say hello to you. Sounds and, good. Uh, thank you for coming and happy birthday. Oh, thank you. It's nice Wonderful. to be involved. Yeah. So um, I've got your book. I've seen your <clears throat> TED talk. So um, I'm kind of all excited to actually really meet you and, uh, and have a chat and see uh, how much that you can in this short time. I know it's not a long time. It's a bit of a challenge even um, to see if you can give over to the people that are going to be watching this um, from your wisdom and see how we can get through this from your point of view. That sound all right to you? It sounds great. Sounds great. This is the first time we've met face to face, isn't it? Well, this is the first time we've met face to face. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really great. I'm, I'm part of the ACBS community. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I, I've heard about you through that as well. And um, yeah, it's quite exciting, quite, quite exciting to actually meet you and talk to you and, you know, and see you. Hopefully one day we'll actually do it. You know, we're living in a world where we don't have human connection physically at the moment. So hopefully that will happen for us. But in the meantime, this is, this is the best we've got. And I really appreciate you giving up your time and on your birthday uh, to come along here. Oh, no problem. It's an honor to be asked. You know, one of the unexpected uh, side benefits of the, the physical social distancing thing has been, I've been uh, actually spending a fair bit of time connecting with people uh, all around the world like this, you know, and yeah. people, I often, uh, we don't have time to do that. So, uh, because everything's slowed down a bit for some of us, or at least I'm home a lot more, Yeah, it's easier uh, to do that. And I've had a lot of nice conversations with really wonderful people all over the world because Connecting with them is now as easy as connecting with my next door neighbor. It's amazing, isn't it? We could be next door to each other right now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and yeah, I, I've actually been since I've been three weeks now. At the beginning, I was kind of voluntary uh, in uh, isolation, and it went into uh, obligatory isolation by the government here. But so I've been more or less three weeks uh, like this. I've never been um, busier in my whole life. I'm, I'm from yeah. dawn till dusk. I'm meeting people. I'm talking to people. I'm putting out shows. I'm putting. It's absolutely incredible what you can actually do when everything else has to stop, right? Yeah. And you rediscover that there's a whole bunch of uh, resources there and vitality that you can tap into that um, is not. You don't usually get time to even recognize that. Yeah, it's a real privilege um, to be able to do that. I share that experience because my, you know, my primary sort of day gig is as an academic. You know, I've been sort of uh, socked in the last three weeks, finishing up a quarter and then putting all my academic courses online and learning this whole new way of, of teaching and, and to, to be able to still have a job and to, to have still ways of contributing, even though you know, the, the paradigms have changed so much because we're all stuck at home. It's a real privilege. And I recognize that that's something that a lot of people have a very different situation. They have jobs that they just can't do at home, which uh, I think deprives them a little bit of grounding that, yeah. that for example, people like you and I have, because we're, you know, we're, our world is different, but we're still doing our stuff. We still have yeah. the freedom to do that. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Okay, so I'm just going to check the, we've got Khafit here. Um, they're coming in from Israel, we've got Adam, we've got Malcolm from Manchester in the UK, we've got Kevin from the UK. Um, so I'm just going to ask, to put in the comments um, where you're coming in from. Uh, we've got people building up now on YouTube as well. So ask any questions that you want to do in the, um, in the comments, and I'll try to get them over to Russell. Um, and in the meantime, Russell, I think we can uh, begin. Um, so with your permission. Oh, you know, it's your show. <laughs> Go ahead. 
no problem. Hello and welcome everybody to the virtual conference live talks with myself, Dov Benyakov of Kurtzman. And uh, I have a real treat for you uh, today. Uh, my guest is Russell Colts. Now, as I always do, I ask the, my guests to introduce themselves because I believe that they can do more justice uh, than me. And I've also found out between you and me, Russell, sometimes when I'm introducing people, I end up getting some out of date information and so on and so forth. So I'm going to ask you in a couple of seconds just to give a kind of a introduction of who you are, what you are, what you do sort of thing very quickly. And the idea of tonight is to be very practical. It's not a kind of an interview, you know, that kind of podcast kind of thing. There's people right now watching you, uh, tuning into this, that are um, in some sort of distress, we can say, whether everybody's got their different, uh, some more distress than others, but at one point where the whole world at the moment is in some sort of distress, some of these emotions that can come out with distress can be even anger, especially when we're all cooped up in the houses and there's all sorts of people um, that we're just not used to being with 24 hours a day. Um, and I know your TED talk was uh, on anger. And so I thought, wow, that might be a, a nice angle. But generally speaking, having that self-kindness, self-compassion, I thought, well, I've got, to, I've got to invite you on. So first of all, thank you very much for coming on. And I'll hand it over to you. The idea is that we have a kind of a nano workshop within 20 minutes. See what we can do, see what you can do. And over to you, Russell. Sounds good. Well, given that we've only got 20 minutes, I'll be brief on the intro. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and a professor uh, at Eastern Washington University and just outside of Spokane, Washington in the US. Um, that's the other side of the state from Seattle. And uh, my focus really the last few years has been on compassion and compassion-focused therapy and how people can use compassion and compassion-focused therapy to work with uh, difficult emotions and different, uh, difficult emotional experiences. And one theme that runs through uh, compassion-focused therapy, which is abbreviated CFT, is that a lot of the struggles that we face in life um, in terms of our difficult emotions and how easy it is to get caught up in those and just how we react to things in the world are, are due to factors that we don't choose or design. Uh, things like how our brains evolved and how the, the literally the neurochemistry of how all that works in the brain and how we're shaped by social forces we don't get to choose or design and how we're uh, impacted by things that happen in the world that we don't get to choose or design. Like all of us are discovering right now, right? We've yeah. got this inherently kind of crappy situation that's going on where we're all kind of stuck indoors and uh, you know, we're, we're scared because it, maybe this is something that we're, we're worried that we might get or we have uh, people we know who are vulnerable in different ways and we're, we're scared for them. So it, there's a whole lot of emotions coming up uh, due to factors we didn't get to choose or design, but we, you know, we, we have no choice but to deal with. So that, and, and, just a, and, and it's the whole world, uh, Russell, isn't it? The whole world together. And you know what went through my mind today? Because we're always talking about us being frightened of what's going on, us being threatened by other people. But other people are actually now threatened by us because yeah. we could be um, <laughs> infecting others. And so there's that side of it as well. We all of a sudden find ourselves people walking across the other side of the street when we are when we are walking. So people begin to be frightened of us, and that might bring up some sort of guilt and shame there as well that uh, would be relevant to to what you're talking about. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you say that because you know we have the, our emotion regulation systems, right? The way our emotions work are are buried kind of deep like below consciousness, right? So our emotions, when we feel something, it's not like I'm, I'm choosing to feel it. I'm like, well, you know, maybe a bit of anger today would be nice. Or I think I'll, you know, be afraid for a while, you know, just to mix things up, you know, that's not what happens. What happens is, you know, some something comes in from the outside world or even from our own thoughts and mental imagery and the kind of pack, uh, pattern recognition portion of our emotional architecture, you know, our emotional uh, uh, structures in the brain go, oh, wow, that's bad. I need to feel threatened about that, right? So even if you like, if we're walking down the street and someone crosses the street to be away from us, 
even if up here in our fancy new thinky brains, we can go, okay, they're crossing the street because they're doing appropriate social distancing. This is not about me. The emotional parts of our brains can watch that happening and feel rejected, right? right? So like, Absolutely. oh, they don't wanna be near me. And that can hurt even though like objectively we know what that's about. And so that's just an example of kind of the tricky interplay between our emotion regulation systems and our uh, thinking and reasoning centers that we talk about in CFT all the time, that we can form those loops. So if we can develop this voice in our head, this kind of comforting, compassionate voice that says, hey, this is not about you, they, they're taking care of themselves. And actually by crossing the street, they're taking care of you too, just in case they might have it. They're taking yeah. efforts to make sure you don't. Exactly. And I emphasize that the underside of all of this social isolation and all of this stress and stuff like that uh, that's going on right now, honestly, I think is pure love because a lot of the people in the world don't fall into vulnerable categories. Right. And they're socially isolating to protect the people who are vulnerable. They're socially isolating so they don't contribute to spreading it to people who might be more likely to die from it. And that's a beautiful thing for us to say, we're gonna shut it down. We're gonna shut it all down right. to take care of our most vulnerable. There's some real beauty in that, you know, it hits me right here, you know? Oh, absolutely. Now you, you are, you are, and you've written a book about it, but you are a, a specialist <laughs> in compassion focused therapy. What, what, what is compassion? You know, what, how do you define what compassion? I've heard it even be called kindness. So what, what is that? How do, you, how do you actually define that for the people that are watching us? Yeah, so compassion-focused therapy, uh, which has been the focus of my career uh, for many years now, was developed by Paul Gilbert in the UK. And I want to give Paul the credit there because this all, all this work that all of us are doing really is, is his life's work that he's sort of given to us. And we're finding ways to translate it and to kind of give it away. But, but in CFT, there is a very specific sort of definition of compassion. And it's actually consistent with the, diction the dictionary definition or what you'd hear from the Dalai Lama. But it is different from uh, a lot of the ideas people have about compassion. So uh, for example, uh, if I'm working with angry men, which I do not infrequently, and I ask them, when compassion comes up, what do you think of that? They'll often say, well, it means being soft or weak or nice all the time or giving everyone everything they want, that kind of stuff. And, you know, one of the fundamental uh, pieces that, that we talk about is that actually compassion is very different from that. Compassion right. is about what we do when suffering and struggle shows up. So if we look at what's happening in the world right now, I mean, those of us who are practicing compassion it, you know, it's, it's tricky for us too, and it's difficult for us too, but at the same time, it, there has to be the recognition that this is what I've been training for. This is the moment, you know, right. because compassion yeah, really- I win, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, compassion is really about being sensitive to suffering in others and in ourselves, being able to recognize when difficulty and struggle and suffering goes up and go, wow, look at what's happening. That's really hard. That's really tough. And to be moved by it. And then to allow that experience of being moved, of noticing and being sensitive to the suffering, to give rise to a motivation to help, right? To, to yeah. step up and say, what can I do to address this suffering? What can I do to prevent it getting worse, right? Which is why you're doing these virtual conferences and why, you know, people all over the planet are doing things they don't need to do in, in the effort to help others. Because we see the suffering. And, and as you say, we're all going through this up for the same thing and we share it and we can recognize that. And that gives rise to this question of what could I do that would be helpful? Right? When you say we're moved by it, what, what is, does that mean empathy? Is that what you're talking about? Or is it something more than that or plus something? I would say moved, uh, to put a word on it, is a little more like sympathy. It's a little bit of heartbreak. You know, it's like you see the suffering and it's like, oh, that, that would be hard. Or if we're seeing it in ourselves to recognize, oh, that is hard. That feels really uncomfortable. Right. Right. So empathy is more kind of understanding what someone's feeling. Sympathy is like feeling something in relation to that. Right. And so empathy is about understanding where the sympathy is more motivational. It's like, oh yeah, that I, I share a little bit of that heartbreak and that motivates me to want to help. Right, okay. And then you said the, the, the third part of it, if you like, is you actually have to do something. 
you know, to be compassionate is not just enough to to feel somebody's pain. It's about actually doing something. Is that right? It, it does. But this this word doing something can mean lots of things. Right. right? So I, I think if all you can manage is to sit, depending on where you're at and what's going on with you, if all you can manage is to sit and like wish or hope that whoever that individual you see suffering, that things could be a little easier for them. In terms of your own mind, that's doing something. Oh, right? really, if you're just, if it's just between you and yourself. Yes, yes. Yeah. To cultivate a compassionate wish that things could be better. Right. Or, right. Or even to just, if you notice pain, like in terms of self-compassion, if you notice pain in yourself, right, uh, or that you're really suffering and you're really having a hard time, and if all you do is to shift from criticizing that or trying to ignore it to a perspective that says, wow, that's really hard. What would help me right now? What would be helpful as I like go through this really difficult experience? What would help me be as comfortable as possible while I endure this difficulty and, and help me, you know, be the best version of me I can? Well, well, that's plenty, you know, and I think it's, I think it's very tricky because compassion does involve the motivation to do something. But I, I think that the underside of that, which sometimes we don't talk about, is that sometimes we can feel really helpless. Sometimes in terms of actually changing anything that's happening in the world or even in our lives, there's not a lot we can do. Right. But what we can always do is to check in with the perspective we're taking towards that experience and see, is that one that's that's driving up the thread? Is that one that's, am I ruminating about all the really difficult stuff? Or could I shift to a more caregiving perspective by asking questions like, what would be helpful? What would um, be helpful? And that could be regarding somebody else. And that could be- Or, or the me. self. Yeah, regarding me. Yeah. So just one second. Actually, just, I'm just oh, going go to acknowledge ahead. the people that are tuning in because they're, they're making an effort. So we've got Laura Soslov in the house. We've got Thomas McGowan. We've got Adam Layton, we've got Hofit Gal, Avril Ehrlich, uh, Naftali Harold uh, Halberstadt, we've got Thomas McGowan, we've got Vered Nuriel Porat, we've got Tina Siragusa coming in. If uh, you're um, in Facebook Live, put in where you're coming from. If you've got any questions for Russell while we're talking, then now is the time to write them in and I'll get it over to him right away. So. Uh, also, don't forget to share. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to put on a watch party. Boaz Kurtzman's coming in. And um, lots of likes and loves and hearts and things as well. We're talking about compassion. So a little bit of compassion also for Russell. Okay, Russell, um, I said to you when we first started, we want it to be a kind of an experiential thing, a kind of a nano, nano workshop. Um, for the people that, you and me and the people that are all watching, whether they're on YouTube or whether they're on uh, Facebook Live, or whether they're even watching uh, this on replay, could we do something kind of experiential? Sure, sure. You know, there, there are lots of things we could do. But the, the one thing, the, the reason I was excited to do this is that your emphasis was on something really pragmatic that might actually be helpful to people who are kind of struggling with this and having a hard time. And, and I think one of the reasons people struggle is that they see they're having a hard time and they, they've sort of got this idea that they shouldn't be. Right. right? That, and, and it's very easy for, if you've got that idea kind of lurking in the background and you see yourself really having a hard time or being scared or being shut down or not being motivated or feeling like you're not doing all the stuff that you feel like you ought to be doing, it's really easy to get self-critical and to feel down on yourself. And, and so um, the one thing I wanted to really, uh, lead people with experientially is, is this is a practice but it's not as so much a meditation as we often do as a, a, a practice you can do briefly when you see yourself in that moment right when you catch yourself really scared or really down or being down on yourself because you're struggling with with whatever or you know uh whatever happens to be going on so what i'd like anyone who's watching right now if you would just try and bring to mind um a situation in which you've struggled the last, you know, few weeks, right? With all this uh, COVID-19 business going on, uh, bring to mind uh, a time you've struggled. Could you, could you wait a little bit, please? Um, sorry, my son's making himself a sandwich. Okay. 
<laughs> bring to mind um, the time you struggled. And if you could, like, in your mind, see if you can kind of just connect with that struggling version of you, right? To see if you it can, feels can uncomfortable. Right? try to bring that to, to mind, that version right. of you struggling with whatever that was, and to, to look at it from a compassionate perspective and, and, and to ask yourself, right, given everything you know about you, like what you learned growing up, uh, all the things that have happened to you in your life, all the things you learned and didn't learn, what you know about your emotions and how they play out in you, and, and also what you know about everything that's going on in the world, right? Just all this crazy stuff that's happening that none of us chose, none of us designed, none of us said, oh, I'm, I want to sign up for that. And I'd like you to ask yourself two questions. So the first question I'd like you to ask yourself is, given all of that, given everything you know about you and about all these situations and experiences, does it make sense that you would struggle right now? Does it make sense that you would struggle with whatever that situation is? And I'm gonna give you a hint. The answer to that question is always yes. Yeah. It's always Yes, because our struggles occur in contexts in which they make sense, right? It makes absolute sense that you would struggle with exactly this. Yeah. I think that's a very important question to start with because it allows us to honor that, yeah, this is painful and it makes sense that it would be painful, but there's nothing that's wrong with me, right? It's, it's the way it is. So once you've asked that first question, given what I know, does it make sense that I would struggle or suffer in this way? And you've answered it, yes. The next question I'd like you to ask yourself is, given this, what would be helpful? Given this, given that this is my experience right now, given that this is the way it is, I didn't choose it, I didn't want it, and maybe that applies to what's happening out in the universe. Maybe that applies to what I'm feeling right here. But given this, what would be helpful? And that question starts with acceptance, doesn't it? It starts with this acknowledgement that, yeah, this is, this is a real experience I'm having. And it's not good or bad or right or wrong. It may be uncomfortable, but it's what's happening right now in, in my field of experience. And then it asks that compassionate question, what would be helpful? And it's important that we not get caught into interpreting that question as what would be helpful, helpful to fix it or right. to solve it or to get rid of whatever the difficult thing is, because that's yeah, not that's what it yeah. yeah. So often we can't change it. Yeah. 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 It's easy to fall into that. A lot of times the answer to that question, given this, what would be helpful is what would be helpful in helping me be as comfortable as I can as I endure this inherently difficult situation, as I go through this really challenging time? What would help me feel safe? What would help me uh, uh, be at my best? What would help me, even as I'm suffering, right, feel a little more connected or a little more balanced or a little more centered? And, and to just acknowledge that this is, there are going to be some rough times as we go through this. And but that's okay. Of course, there would be rough times. This is an inherently difficult situation. Yeah. So what we need to do is to give ourselves room to work with that. And that can involve lots of things. I would encourage people, you know, I could say, well, you can do this and this and this and this. There's the basic stuff, right? Exercise universally helps. Time outside tends to universally help. Getting sleep and eating as well as you can universally tends to help. But I also would encourage people to think about the times in your life, that the, the things in your life, the relationships in your life, the experiences that help you feel safe and grounded and, and, and connected, and to make sure you build that stuff in, into your days, right? So, you know, that's what I've been doing all day, right? right. It's my birthday. So I worked hard ahead of time to give myself the day off. And I started out by putting on some music from my youth and, and playing like Pac-Man and Galaga and these video games from when I was 13 and 14, because those are very soothing to me, right? And then I went and I, I took a shower and I just really enjoyed the, the hot water and the feeling of that. 
which is another thing I find soothing. So I want to encourage people to use what you know about you to, to connect with things that help you feel safe and soothed. I've been Skyping and Zooming and texting with all these people I love all over the world. And every time I do that, it, it just gives me a little bit of a lift. So, you know, those two questions and then encouraging people really to use what you know about what helps you feel centered and grounded and to build that stuff in, right? And to unashamedly do that, right? Don't yeah. get caught in these narratives of I have to be really productive or I have to be strong or I have to be, you don't have to do anything, but yeah. take care of you and the people you love. Wow, that, uh, that's amazing. I, I love that because, first of all, of the simplicity. It's not a big, big thing. Two questions, right? Two very yeah. straightforward questions that one of them is leading to, you know, acknowledge your situation, even if it's painful. Acknowledge it. You know, we are living in weird times. We are living in kind of unknown what's going on. We have our own histories and... Is this painful at the moment? Yeah, it is. It is painful. And that acknowledgement, I think, already gives that sense of, well, at least somebody knows what's going on in here. You know, I know that I'm having a certain amount of pain right now. Like, and of yeah. course, it's painful. How could it yeah. not be painful, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of people, what they think is, let's, you know, I, I've got to keep myself, just like you said, I've got to keep myself so busy. I don't want to even think about the fact that it's painful. I don't even want to think, I've got to be creative now. This yeah. is the time I've got to be creative. I've got to be coming out with all sorts of new things. I've got, to, that's one side of the thing. And, and on the other side of the scale, you might get people that are just completely crashed out, exhausted, don't know mm -hmm. what to do, bored, and this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. They're not working. They're at home. Yeah. They, you know, but all you know, Everything's gone. Changed. The whole the whole life has changed. So acknowledge that is what <clears> you're saying. Yeah, it's painful. It's really painful. Yeah. But at the same time, you're saying, okay, but what can be done? What can I do? What can happen that will create a sense of safety for me? Because at the end of the day, that is what our brain is kind of looking for, isn't it? Either we're in danger or we're in safety. There's not really anything it's interested in apart from that. So if we feel that we're safe by even tuning in and watching you and listening to you. Well, for me, for instance, that gives me a sense of, I would like to do that to make me feel safe because I'm going to learn from what you tell me. So that's okay. Now, at least I know more or less what I could do if I, if I get this kind of feeling in, you know, during the day. Um, and others that I'm inviting on here to do the same. And I think that's why people are are coming online and watching this stream exactly because of that. But there might be other things that they can do. And I think the, that just that kind of two question, um, I don't want to call it a protocol, but the two question kind of exercise that we could all do to ourselves, I think is very, very powerful. We can also apply it to others too, right? When, when someone else is responding in a way that is challenging to us, Right. right. Instead of judging and labeling them the way we might judge and label ourselves, what if we ask, okay, given what I know about them and what's going on in the world and what they're going through, does it make sense? Or even how does it make sense from their side that they would react in this way? Because it does make sense. If they're doing it, there's some, from their side, there's some reason it does make sense. And right. so if we start by validating and acknowledging, yeah, there's something happening from their side that's really hard, given that, what would be helpful? Because there's a good chance there's going to be a lot of tension in people's houses. As the more that this goes on, the more people that are in the in the family or are are living together, they're going to. They're, this is really going to be very useful for them because it's naturally just acknowledging the way we are that there is a good chance that things will get heated up a little bit. Absolutely, it's so easy for people's threat systems to bounce off of each other, right? Yeah. So. If person's feeling angry or anxious, it's so easy for them to interact with the partner in a way that triggers exactly that thing. And so you go back and forth and back and forth and it gets worse and worse and threat goes up. I mean, divorce applications have like tripled in the United States since this all started. How's because really? threat, right. threat, 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 threat. Yeah. So if, if we can recognize that, it just takes one person, right? It just takes one person to recognize what's happening and go, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. It makes so much sense that we're both feeling so threatened right now. The world is crazy right now. But I want you to know that what I said then, I didn't mean that. I, I, I'm, I'm feeling all torn up and stressed out. And I know you are too. Can, can we just give each other the benefit of the doubt? Remember, we're on the same team. 
and you know let's go watch shrek or whatever it is that helps us yeah. feel safe together right yeah yeah that togetherness to I, revisit I love that stuff so i'm going to go just have a look and see if there's anybody asking any questions oh that'd so, be great um let's just see um i would thank you from Vered. He's loving it um amy uh amy murrell amy murrell is watching oh um, wow Amy, <laughs> read watching. Amy's books. You want to do better, yeah. read Amy's books. <laughs> so Adam asks, is being, oh, by the way, I should tell everybody it's Russell's birthday today. So don't forget about that. <laughs> um, is being caring about people who I may not be able to offer anything, not possibly overwhelming? In other words, if I limit my compassion to those I may be able to help, wouldn't that be easier? So the question is, those that I can't offer anything to, um, is caring about them not going to overwhelm me? Well, I, you know, that's a really good question. Um, because, and that's, that's one of the reasons earlier when I emphasized do something, that it, it's important that we not think, oh, I must do something to change their experience. Because if we do uh, open our awareness, to all this suffering that's out there in the world that I can't do anything about, um, it can be overwhelming, right? right. It can be overwhelming. Um, but that's also an opportunity to sort of acknowledge, to work on self-compassion and compassion for others at the same time. We can acknowledge it. When I really extend out like that, it is overwhelming because I feel like I can't do much. So how do I help myself feel kind of safe while, while I allow myself to do that? And for me, one way of doing that uh, in terms of managing that is saying, well, maybe I can't do anything to change that, but maybe I can try and put something good out into the world uh, right. that could eventually filter out in that direction. So, for example, if I can afford to make a donation to a group that's trying to do something for vulnerable people, or if I can even, you know, throw a, a kind message out on social media to let people uh people know. So I, I think there's some real wisdom in that question, which says, would it be better to, to uh, restrict my compassion down to the sphere of influence? I would suggest it's not about restricting, but choosing where we put our energy and attention to acknowledge that, gosh, there is a lot of suffering out there. And I, I do, if I ruminate on that, yeah. I, I feel overwhelmed by it. So instead of ruminating on it, I'll acknowledge it and I'll acknowledge that it's painful. And then as the, the question really implies, I'm gonna shift my focus to, to my sphere of influence. And how do I uh, you know, help the people that I care about? How do I connect with them? How do I work with myself? But I don't think it's so much that you're purposefully not caring about those folks out there, but you're not ruminating about the stuff yeah. that you can affect. And instead you're shifting your attention in a kind of skillfully compassionate way, asking the question, okay, given the connections I have and given the, the sphere of influence I have, what can be helpful? You know, I can't, I can't, there are a lot of people I can't help, but I can go on and do an interview on your show and maybe somebody watching that, uh, some, they'll get something useful from that. Yeah, and there'll be people that you don't necessarily know and they'll be listening to this uh, today, tomorrow, the next day and get something out of it. Yeah, I mean, this, and this is something that I could borrow from my acceptance commitment therapy colleagues, right? Which yeah. is, accepting it's like acknowledging there's the stuff i can't affect that's a really difficult painful stuff let me bow to that accept it not acknowledge it and then say how do i move in a direction that feels important how do i move you know so it's not like i'm pretending that's not there i'm not pushing anything away i'm acknowledging it and then i'm asking the question what could i do that would be meaningful how could i engage in compassionate action that would benefit somebody yeah and when we do that that benefits us too so thank you, Adam, for that great question. I hope that answered it for you. Astri is watching, Sharon's watching, Nancy's watching, Oshrat's watching, Norman Evans from Canada and Toronto's watching. Um, Glenn Cohn is watching. Um, Moran's watching. Powell is watching. Uh, where are you watching from? Give us an idea. Um, Norman Evans says, have walking meetings. I, I, I average over 10,000 steps a day listening to music, <laughs> podcasts, and phone calls. Um, I love it. Fly by. Um, Amy says, hi. And uh, happy birthday, says Avril. 
Uh, Liat's watching, Lilach's watching, Chofit, Vered, Moran, they're all saying happy birthday. Norman says happy birthday. Um, Norman saying you, happy everybody. birthday. Um, Adam says he loved the answer connecting to our values. That's great. Um, Amy says, love this. Given the connections I have, what can I do to help? That's her question from Amy. Given, lo, given the connections I have, what can I do to help? Absolutely. Like, how can I work within my sphere of influence, within my yeah. connection? What can I do that's helpful? Yeah. And what happens is, when we focus on that, right? When we focus on that, then the other stuff isn't so troubling. It's not like it goes away, but we're working skillfully with our attention to focus on yeah. what's helpful. Yeah. So these questions are really important to ask yourself with kindness and say, look, what can I do? What, what is it? Even if it's a tiny little thing, and even if it's like you said away at the beginning, even if it's just having that intention to help, even if it's not actually, if it's within me to have an intention that I'd like to be able to offer somebody help. Yeah. And if, it might even be in the form of charity. It might even be in the form of what you're doing now. And it might be even in the form of just going and doing a bit of shopping for somebody. Yeah, or, or snuggling with your dog. Right, yeah, and yeah. feel a little more loved, or Absolutely. playing a game with your child, or you know, uh, putting some seed out for birds. Absolutely, uh, it, as Amy, with that has, caring, putting your hand over your heart and having some compassion for yourself, and just feeling that touch and that you know that um, kindness that you can offer yourself. Sometimes when you can't help everybody. Absolutely. Well, and that for those who are watching who aren't familiar with this area of self-compassion, what it really comes down to is uh, orienting and relating towards yourself when you're struggling in the same way that you would relate to anyone that you really loved and cared about and wanted to help. So that's wow. a good place. If, if someone else I knew that I really cared about was going through this, how would I want to be there for them? And then think, how could I offer some of that to me? That's self-compassion. So Verit is asking, I find it I find it um, sharing happy, happiness these days is considered being not compassionate. That oh, so, so she feels a certain amount of guilt if she can't be that compassionate. Okay, so she feels guilt because she can't feel the compassion or ex can't express it. Um, I'm not quite sure, but she she finds it difficult when she wants to share happiness. Yeah, yeah. So, so she's finding that guilt. I think a lot of people go through this, right? I, I think a lot of people, there are some of us, you know, I, I have to be honest, and, and I, I feel kind of bad saying this, honestly, I lean introvert. So for me to hunker down at home with all my, you know, I've got like 1500 vinyl records and my books and all the stuff I like to do. That, that's not terribly stressful for me, but I've got extroverted friends who are literally, you know, almost banging off the walls of their house. They're just because right. the they are in the world has completely changed where for me it's been minimal and i think it's easy to to feel really guilty about that right if if you're right. getting you're happy or you're relatively privileged in the way that i am you know you get to keep working and your income's not really affected it can be it can be easy to feel guilty about that or to feel like i shouldn't be happy or i shouldn't maybe share that happiness and i think on one hand i'd, I'd like to say whatever you're feeling right allow that Right. And if you're happy, good for you. You know, if you can find some happiness and some ways to enjoy things to enjoy as we all go through this, that's wonderful. Give yourself permission to do that. And then in terms of relating compassionately to others, I, I think there's a real point there that the question is, is making, which is that sometimes if we've got someone who's really struggling, sharing with them how happy we are is probably not the best way to be compassionate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, for that person probably much better to say something like, you know, I, I see how hard this is for you and I'm so sorry. You know, I yeah. wish there was yeah. something to do uh, that would be helpful. And very often just letting them know in whatever way we can that they can receive that we care about them is like the most helpful thing we could do. Absolutely. I, I, I'm constantly giving an example of my next door neighbor. Um, and my next door neighbor for every, you know, couple of days or so calls me and asks me uh, if he can bring me some food, he can do some shopping for me and so on. As it happens, I don't really need it. 
But what's more powerful than that is the fact that he's calling me, the fact that yeah. he's interested in me, the fact that he's I know you in mind. thinking about me. It's, a, it's, an, it's an incredible thing. I find myself on my own, so I don't have anybody here with me. Um, and, I, you know, I managed to get through that. It's okay. But knowing that there's somebody out there that's actually thinking about me, knowing if I need something, I could call him and, and, and he would be there for me. That is a real powerful, uh, has a real powerful effect on me, more than the shopping or whatever it is that he would do for me. I want everyone who's feeling alone and isolated or feeling like I can't do anything, there's nothing I can do to change any of this, to listen to what you just said, right? Because you just said the most powerful part, the most helpful thing that I got from my neighbor is just to know that he held me in mind. There was someone out there who cared what was happening to me. There's someone out there who, who, who cared enough to reach out to me. So if you're feeling helpless and you're feeling like there's nothing you can do, bow to that feeling of hopelessness, right? It's, it's, it's a yeah. real thing. And then recognize that you have incredible power to impact the lives of other people in a real positive way by doing nothing more than letting them know you care by sending a text message or a phone call or an email just to say, hey, I was thinking about you. And this, this is a crazy world we're all dealing with. And I just hope things are okay. And, you know, just checking in and expressing caring, it can turn around someone's entire day. You know, it really oh, is. Yeah. And that's power we all have. And it doesn't cost any money. You know, it just, so that's, yeah. it, it's, it's really And it can take a few seconds. It doesn't have to yeah. be something very long. Um, so, yeah. So Norman says, I can understand that some people are suffering and have empathy. I like what Russell is saying. So, yeah. So, well, we've had a massive audience tonight. Everyone wants to, to listen to Russell and I, and I can really, really <laughs> understand why I've, the time has flown by. I let it Thanks, go past the 20 minutes, obviously, because this was just too um, valuable to cut short. I really appreciate everything, especially on your birthday, but just in general. Um, it was great, great, great meeting you, Russell. I look forward to the day when I can shake your hand, buy your drink, and um, sit down and have a real chat with you. We'll do it. That'll be great. Wonderful. I just all sign off, but I want to tell everyone, take care of yourselves, be kind to yourselves, and... Um, you know, you got a lot of people on your side. Don't forget yeah. that. Wonderful. Take care. Be safe. Be healthy. You too. Bye-bye.